DevOps and microservices strategy. He conducts strategy sessions, workshops, and education sessions, and drives the change with Red Hat strategic customers all over North America. Um, thank you for being here, Veer, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Alex. So yeah, Veer Muchendi from Red Hat. I'm a chief architect for Container Solutions. What it means, I do education sessions like this. I work with uh, strategic customers, helping them adopt uh, containers, container platforms, microservices, DevOps, all good stuff. OK. Today's session, I'm going to talk about uh, building, deploying, and running serverless applications in the context of DevOps. Right? So we are going to talk about some latest and greatest I would say bleeding edge technologies, things that are still being baked. And I'll also be showing some demos, uh, time permitting how much, how much ever we can go forward with, right? That's, that's the intent of today's session. So uh, first question, uh, how many of you are uh, know Kubernetes? Heard of Kubernetes, yeah? Have you used Kubernetes as well? Yeah, some of you, okay. So uh, one of the, Things, I mean, this is just a half hour session, so there is an assumption that people are at least aware of Kubernetes for this session. So I'm going with that assumption forward, right? So when, when, I, when we talk about serverless, which is the area of focus for today's session, what do we mean by that? Can there be anything that can run without a server, any, any program that you can think of that can run without a server? Not really, right? So serverless is just a name for a paradigm. It's, it's a little misleading. It's not really serverless. You need server somewhere. But it is, a, it is a model, a cloud computing model, where you think about how do I write my code and execute somewhere, and the provider, the cloud provider, will make the resources available, the servers available. You don't, have, you don't need to create tickets. You don't have to be responsible for making those resources available and all that. It is, I use whenever I want. I just want to run some code. and. The, uh, the servers are available somewhere in the cloud and it, it, it gets running, right? It's not just that. You are only using it when you need it and you, when you don't need it, you just don't consume any resources. So there is not anything that is always running all the time, right? That's another thing about serverless. Third, you're also paying for what you use, right? Not, not, you're not paying for something that is just lying down there as, uh, and you're not even touching it or using it. So these three things, when you put together, that is what is being popularly called a serverless paradigm. Now, one of the key things here, I said, is cloud provider takes care of. So is cloud, who is this cloud provider? Is that like AWS, Google, uh, or uh, Microsoft, or any of these cloud providing organizations? Are, the, are those the only ones we are thinking about? Or can we get that paradigm? It looks attractive, right? I can use resources. Whenever I want, I can use those resources uh, in my, uh, uh, I can pay for only those resources that I use, and when I'm not using it, it automatically shuts off. Can that be brought into my enterprise and use it, right? If I am running something in, in a cluster in my organization, can I just consume my enterprise resources also the same way, right? That is where we are going to. And this is where Kubernetes comes into play. So how do we make serverless paradigm come on to Kubernetes. So what is Kubernetes? Again, for those who don't know, Kubernetes is a model where you are running applications in the new containerized fashion within your data center or any cloud. It doesn't really matter where, where you are running it. Right? There are technologies available that are based on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an orchestrator for containers. What does that mean? When you want to run containerized applications at scale, hundreds of them on an infrastructure of your choice, who is that one that makes decisions on how do I run these applications? Where do these applications run? How do I put a load balancer on the top of these apps that are running? How do I do networking? How do I uh, manage the health of these applications? If a container goes down, can another container come in its place in a different place? Make sure that the application is running healthy and all that. That's the kind of thing Kubernetes does. Now, Kubernetes is almost there in every enterprise and every known vendor in the industry is talking about using Kubernetes. If that's the case, can we have this serverless model on the top of Kubernetes? That's our subject for today. So in order to, I'm going to be presenting a little less and doing demos more. So 
there will be a couple of slides and then we will move on to the demos. Okay? So we are talking about some new technologies on the top of Kubernetes. These were announced just about a year ago. Right? And uh, the technologies are uh, K-native. This is an open source project. And under this open source project, there are two branches. One of them is called K-native serving, which, is, which provides the serverless paradigm for our applications. Specifically, serverless paradigm for containerized applications, which means the containerized applications running on the top of Kubernetes. So on Kubernetes, I have an application that is already containerized. Can I make it serverless? That's the problem K-native serving is addressing. What does it do? When you are using your application, it runs those containers. When you are not using that application, it scales it down to zero. Right? Things that are needed, all the infrastructure that is needed to do what I just said is implemented as part of that open source project called K-native serving. That's the first thing we are, going, uh, we are talking about. Right? Second, there is another branch of K-native called K-native eventing. What is that? K-native eventing is Let's say you have an application, right? And it, this is, you are trying to run it as a serverless app, right? It's, it's scaled down to zero. It is, it's not running. What is that which goes and triggers that app when it has to actually come up, right? There should be some event coming from outside that, that will trigger the job. What are those kinds of events? It could be a browser call that you are making, or it could be a message coming from somewhere there could be different kinds of triggers that are coming in. When those triggers are, those events are coming in, you may do not want to send everything to your application. You may want to shift it here and there. So message-oriented middleware and triggers, brokers, and all those things will come up. Those things are all implemented as part of K-native eventing. How do I deal with the events is implemented as part of K-native eventing, right? That's the second thing we are talking about. The third one is, I talked about containerized applications, but where do these containers come from, right? You have to build your applications as containers. In order to build those applications, you need to create container images so that you can instantiate those container images and run them as containers. How do I create these container images? Goes back to our CI CD process, right? You need pipelines to create containers and build and deploy them and manage them. Can I have these pipelines also in Kubernetes native way? That means it should run as containers, as Kubernetes native objects like pods on a Kubernetes cluster without investing in some extra tools and technologies outside, right? Can I do that? That is where another project comes into play. This is also open source. This is called Tekton, right? All these projects are very, very new. Some of them are like uh, from Red Hat's perspective. I work for Red Hat, right? So I'm all these projects are open source projects, but they are supported by Red Hat. But from the, ter from the terms of supporting, we are not there yet. These are yet to be GA'd. These are in dev preview, tech preview. So that's the reason why I said it's, a, it's all bleeding edge. These are things that are changing all the time. It changes every day. Okay? So they are, they are yet to be GA'd. Sometime in the next year, they will come up. But since you guys are all here to on, in DevOps days and you want to see what's coming up, that's the reason why I wanted to introduce this thing to you, right? Be prepared for what's coming up next year kind of thing, okay? So let's talk about Tekton first because we have to build something in order to run it, right? So what is Tekton? As I said, Tekton's, Tekton is for pipelines. And in the world of Red Hat, we have a Kubernetes platform called OpenShift. Have you heard of OpenShift, anyone? Yeah, few of you, yeah. So OpenShift is enterprise-ready implementation of Kubernetes. And these technologies that I just talked about are supported on the top of OpenShift. Tekton pipelines are called OpenShift pipelines in the world of OpenShift. It's the same exact technology, but it is a supported technology. So we give a different name from Red Hat. It's called OpenShift pipelines. So Tekton pipelines, they run on Kubernetes. They, everything that runs as a pipeline. So if you want to start a task in a pipeline, the task starts as a container. It runs as a Kubernetes pod. You can use this pipeline to deploy your containerized applications to any cluster, any Kubernetes cluster. And you can 
you, it is typed in the sense you can, you, it, nothing is hard coded into these pipelines. You can actually lay out the pipeline and you can inject your own resources and run the pipeline whenever you want. So you can exchange the technologies too. It is pretty flexible, okay? So basically what you need to remember is everything runs as containers. It is not non-containerized thing. It is all containers. It runs serverless, again. When you are running a pipeline, with the current technologies for pipeline, for CI, CD, you are always using up certain amount of infrastructure, whether you are actually running a pipeline at a particular point of time or not. This paradigm is different. When you are actually running a pipeline on a Kubernetes cluster, it consumes resources. When the pipeline's job is done, it goes off. Nothing is used. So that those resources are available for other applications to use. It runs on a plain Kubernetes cluster. Okay. Third, it enables DevOps. For, so if you are thinking about automation for a microservices paradigm, this is the new technology there in that world. Okay. So how does a pipeline look like in this world? So first thing we need to think about is pipeline structure itself. A pipeline is made up of a bunch of tasks. The sta tasks are stitched together to make a pipeline. You can run a task as is, or you can create a pipeline with a bunch of tasks. Which task should run after which task is how you define it. As of now, you have to write a YAML to define it. Eventually, you can foresee that, hey, you can actually draw a figure, and it creates that YAML, right? So pipeline would be defined as a set of tasks and dependencies in terms of when, the, when which task would run. You will also define what resources are consumed by the pipeline. So for example, let's say if you are, uh, if, if you wrote code and your code needs to be compiled, compiled, build and execute, built and executed, right? Which code are you supplying to the pipeline? That should be a resource. It should be an input. You don't want to hard code that in the pipeline, right? In the same way, when the code gets built, the result of that build process is a container image. What do you want to name that container image? Again, that should be a resource. You don't want to hard code anything into the pipeline. So you will take the pipeline, you, you define a pipeline, what steps to run, and you supply that with the resources. When you run the pipeline, the pipeline run is an instantiation of pipeline. So pipeline is, a, is like a template, and pipeline run is an instantiation of that pipeline, and we are not, when you're actually running the pipeline, it consumes those resources that you define, and it will actually run the pipeline. Make sense? So template, actual run. Actual run uses the, uses the resources that you supply. So everything that is running in these pipelines will run as pods. Pods are those Kubernetes, first class Kubernetes components. Any containers that are running on Kubernetes run as pods, right? So pipelines also run as pods. You don't need extra tools, technologies, or anything like that. That's how this is designed. This is the architecture of pipelines in just a couple of minutes. I mean, we can get deeper and deeper, but we don't have that amount of time. So with this in mind, let's do a demo of pipelines itself. <laughs> By the way, uh, this is the link um, for all, all my demos that I'm going to show today. I'm not going to be able to show everything that is in the, in the, at this link. If you want to try it yourself, you would want to refer to this. I'll share this presentation if you're, you don't have to note, it, note down this link or anything. All right. So the link would take you to a tutorial, and this tutorial has a bunch of labs. The first one tells you how to install all these technologies that I'm talking about. The second one is talking about pipelines. And uh, we'll, I'll first create a project. I think I already created it. So I created a new project. And uh, in the world of Kubernetes, for those of you who are using Kubernetes, you already know that the security is implemented with something that we call service accounts. Under whose credentials a particular job gets run is defined by what we call as service accounts. What I did right now is created a service account that can be used to run pipeline. So let me make sure that I am...
logged in first. Are you able to see this or should I make it a little bigger? Okay. So then we'll create a couple of tasks. Remember what those tasks are? Tasks are used for building the pipeline. The first task will allow us to create, take a, a, a program that you wrote, and in this case, I'm using Go language to write the program, right? So it will take a Go program, and it will convert that Go into a container image. That's the first task. The second task is a command line tool to talk to Kubernetes, to talk to OpenShift cluster. So I created two tasks. There is a tool that we can use to check what kind of tasks are available. If I say TKN tasks list, it shows me the list of tasks that I created. So one of them is that command line tool for OpenShift client. The other one is the one that takes code and converts that into a container. Now we will use these tasks to create a pipeline, but before that, I'm actually going to create a bunch of objects that are, so if you look at, I'm connecting via my phone, so it may be a little slow. So the project itself, this is the console, web console for uh, OpenShift. The project itself is empty, so I, it is just saying, hey, you can create an application however you want. I'm not going to use any of these methods to create an application. It's just showing the topology view is empty. It is asking me to create an application using one of these methods. What I'm doing is creating a bunch of objects that will that represent my application. It doesn't, it, I'm not running the application yet, but I'm creating a bunch of objects that represent my application. These are Kubernetes objects. These are things like Kubernetes deployment, a route, which will allow me to connect to my application from outside and things like that. So what I'm going to do now is once the objects are created, right, you can see that there is a play, it, there is an application and this is the name of that app, calling it dumpy because it just dumps any request that you send, right? And uh, as of now it is not running because we didn't create the application yet. I just created a representation for that application, objects for that application. So let's look at the pipeline first. So this pipeline, it takes, I'm calling it deploy pipeline, this is the name. The kind is pipeline. So pipeline is now a Kubernetes native object once you install this Knative, uh, the, the Tekton pipelines on your cluster. So you can actually call something called a pipeline. And I gave the pipeline name as deploy pipeline. Remember the tasks that we talked about? The first task is a build step, and I'm calling the task that we created before. Remember I created a task which will convert the code into an image. I'm referring to that task, task reference, right? And I'm, this is going to take a URL for the Git repository as the input, and it is going to output an, a container image. That's the first task. So it knows how to take my Go code and create a container image out of it. That's already there in that task. So it will take source code as the input, and it will create the container image as an output. The next step after the image is created is to go ahead and deploy it. So the next task is I'm asking the OpenShift client to go ahead and roll out that application, the change to that application, and this should be run after the build task. So the first task is build, and the second task is deploy, and the de deploy should always run after the build. So this is how we chain the tasks. So if you can compare with the CI CD technologies that you know of, this is how we would chain it. 
So this is the way to define a task. Again, as I said, this is a YAML as of now, but we are building tools and technologies that will allow you to drag and drop and, 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 and do it much easier than this, right? So let's create the pipeline itself. So I'll use, so pipeline got created. Now, I'll also create some pipeline resources. The first resource is a URL to the Git repo where my code is, and the second resource is the image that should get created. So I'll create these resources now. Resources got created, so if I say TKN resource list, TKN is a command line for Tekton. So Tekton, what resources do you have? It is giving me the list of resources that I just created. So now, I'll start a pipeline. So in order to start a pipeline, again, I'm doing it command line because most of you developers will be using command line to automate things, right? So I'm saying, Tekton, pipeline start, the name of the pipeline that we just created, the service account to be used, and then minus R resource name. The first resource is the source code. The second resource is the resultant application image that needs to get created. So I'll start the pipeline. So it says, hey, the pipeline just started. Look at this for the logs. So logs will start appearing in a minute. But there is, again, if you are using OpenShift, there is a pipelines view here in OpenShift. And our pipeline, the deploy pipeline, the structure of the pipeline is seen here. And if you want to look at the pipeline run, one pipeline is running right now, which we just started, right? Let's look at the details. The build step is running, and the build step includes three different, the build task includes three, three different things, three steps. The first step will go and generate a Docker file because we are creating a container image. The second step will build that Docker file to create a container image. The third step will push that resultant container image into a registry, a container registry. So those are the three different steps inside that build task. The second task will actually go and deploy it. If you want to look at the logs, again, this is the UI way of looking at it. We can see the logs here, or we can see the logs here, right? So this is what is being built. It's, it's coming up still. Like I'm, uh, What I'm talking about is technology that is not ready yet. It is in tech preview right now, okay? So this build will take a couple of minutes. In the meanwhile, let's go back to our presentation to see what next, right? So we, we saw how to create a pipeline, a simple pipeline, right? And how to take our code and convert that into a container image and deploy it. And that's running in the background. Let's look at our next technology. So once we have our container image, what can we do with, with it, right? Can we deploy it as a serverless application? And this is where our other technology called Knative Serving comes into play. So that Knative Serving, again, is an open source project, right? This is being called OpenShift Serverless in the supported version from Red Hat. There are, when you think about the architecture of how this works, there are a few things that, a few uh, terms that we need to understand, concepts, right? The concepts include that, uh, the first thing is a Knative Service. Knative Service, this term service is a little overloaded, right? It means different things to different people. So when you think in terms of Knative, always qualify it as Knative service, which means it is a serverless service. That means it will be created, but it will run only when there is a need for it to run. When it is not, when there is no need for it to run, it will sleep. Such a service is called a Knative service. But this service term itself is a conglomeration of multiple concepts. It includes a configuration. This defines what code is running in the form of a container, again, right? Which particular container image is running? And what environment information are we passing to that container? Like what kind of configuration are we deploying it as? So for example, if this container has to connect to a database, the database connection information is part of the configuration that has to be supplied to that container when it comes up, right? All that is included inside the configuration. Then there is a route. Again, this is a Knative route. What does this mean? When it, whenever you deploy an application, it will automatically create a URL for your app, and when you click on that URL, it will take you to that running application. There is another concept called revision. What is this? 
So you, are, you created a service and you deployed it. And then you made a change. Maybe you have your next version, you deployed that as well. So the old version is available and the new version has come up. You might point your route to the new version completely or maybe if the traffic is coming into the route, you might want to send some traffic to the old version and some, some traffic to the new version. You can do blue-green deployments, you can do A-B testing and things like that. That is what this architecture allows as well. So it is not just doing serverless, it is doing a little bit more than that. It will also allow you to do A-B testing, blue-green deployments, canaries and things like that. Right? All that is built into KNA to serving. So if you think about how my service will look like in reality, Basically, you'll have service which defines everything together. You'll have a configuration, and you have multiple revisions, and your route will route traffic to one or more than one revisions. This is how it will look like. Make sense? OK. Now, with that in mind, let's go back and check where our application is. Oh, OK. So this app got built, and then the resultant container image got pushed into the registry. And then it also got deployed. So this is the deploy step, right? So let's go, up, go back and look at our screen. Uh, where is that? OK. So the deploy build step and deploy step are both complete. You can see both are green, right? Now let's look at our app. Now it shows that it is in blue. This is running application. If I click on this URL, we expect it to work, but it will not because I missed a step. What is that? I the projects in OpenShift, when they are running, they are all fully protected. I have to set up a firewall rule, a virtual firewall rule, to allow somebody to connect to my application. So I'm creating a network policy that allows me to call this application from outside. Once this is applied, shake my phone. OK. So now, let's use our app. It just dumps the HTTP request. Very simple app, right? And if I check the health of it, it will paint nice red hat. That's it. Simple app, right? Now, we have not done serverless yet. We deployed this as a regular application. So whether I'm using this app or not, this app continues to run. Right? It will stay blue forever. That means I'm consuming resources forever. Right? OpenShift by itself has a way to idle the application. So for example, if I say um, OC idle dumpy, that's the name of the app, it will actually get idled. That means it will go off. It turned dark blue, which means that it is terminating, and now it is white. All the resources are released. So it will go in as to a sleep mode. So unless I, if I go and click on this URL again, it will come up. But otherwise, it is sleeping. But this is not serverless. We want this to be automated. It should happen based on actual workload that is coming in. If the workload comes, it should come up. If the workload is not there, it should go for sleep. That's what we want. And that's where Knative serving comes into play. So now, let's go back to Knative serving. This is the next thing serverless application. I know I'm getting close to the time. So we cannot do eventing today. I can only do serving with the amount of time available. Um, so I'm deploying. I'm using KN, which is a K command line tool for Knative. And I'm deploying, creating a service. I'm calling it dumpy serverless this time. right? And I'm using the same image that was created by our build step before. This was the image that was created before. And it ends up creating a serverless service, which is a different instance. So if you go back and look at the topology, serverless instance of that application came up. And this KN here, if you can see it, indicates that it's a serverless. Okay? It is as simple as that. So you just run a simple command, and the serverless version of that application comes up. Now, let's use this application. Same, same exact output, but from a different instance. So this is a serverless instance. Now, if I leave this application as is for one minute, uh, this 
serverless instance goes away automatically. I don't have to run an ideal command, idle command or anything. When I, if I'm not touching this application, or if you don't have good enough vision to copy this URL and call it from your phone, if, I, if I'm lucky enough, then this will, this will just go down automatically in a minute. So in the meanwhile, let's just get introduced to the k-native eventing. What is k-native eventing about? So k-native eventing is, includes uh, event sources, event consumers. Sources are where the events are generated. Event consumers are the ones that are consuming the event. The brokers are things that are standing in between. If you know message-oriented middleware, you know what brokers are, right? So basically, you can configure the triggers to filter the events. By the way, someone, whoever is doing this, I, I need five more minutes because I started five minutes late after this. <laughs> okay. It, it's, it's reasonable, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, and then, then there are channels and subscriptions. So, people who are used to message-oriented middleware, they understand these terms. So, basically, you can do simple source to service delivery mechanism, or you can do complicated channels and subscriptions as well. Or you can do brokers and triggers where broker receives all the events, and you can do filtering by using triggers, and then it goes to the target. Whatever filtered events will go to the target, right? So, let's go back and see what happened to our, not yet. Not one minute yet, that's good. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's gone. You see that? So, it goes off automatically. So, in the, the next example, and that's the last example I'll show, is that of uh, auto scaling. So, what does that mean? If there is more workload, I want to scale up, and there is, if there is less workload, it'll scale down, right? So I'm going to update this service to have a concurrency target of five. What does that mean? How many concurrent requests request is my service going to accept at any point of time? If I don't set this, it will accept innumerable number of requests. And this is a simple service, so it can just service as many requests as you want. So I'm setting a limit on how many each instance will accept. right? So I set a target of five requests. and. Uh, So this will create a new revision. So remember, I talked about multiple revisions. So since I made this change, the older, the first deployment was revision number one. The second deployment is revision number two. Now, if we look at the route, kn route list. So the route, which is this URL, is now pointing to sending 100% of the traffic to revision number two, right? That is automatically done. But you can actually change the route to shift the traffic between revision one and two as well if you wanted to. Let's uh, do some load testing. So I'm going to export the URL to this application. So echo URL. It shows the URL, right? And I'm going to, I'm using a tool called Siege, and the Siege I'm sending 50 requests per second, right? I'm parallelly loading this application. As the siege is done, let's watch how many pods are running. So as of now, one pod is running. Look at how it is scaling up. Three instances now, right? So as the load increases, it keeps on creating more containers. With the amount of load that I am able to pump in, it is only running three instances. But it happened automatically, right? We don't have to actually go and scale up the application. It will automatically scale up based on the amount of workload. Make sense? And then once the job is done, once this siege completes, it is completed, we'll start seeing the pods terminating too in a minute. That's, that uh, you can see that in a, in a in a minute. Any questions? All right. Good with these technologies. Are you excited to see them coming next year? Yeah. Using them. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>